Welcome to the Successfully Unemployed Show. My name is Dustin Heiner, and I'm here to help you learn how to quit that J-O-B, that just overbroke job by investing, by having a side hustle, by any means possible. Today, I'm bringing on a super awesome expert who's going to show us how he basically has become successful and unemployed with many different ways, definitely also with tax, um, what is it, uh, asset protection, being a lawyer, as well as investing and all that sort of having businesses. It's super amazing. I have Clint Coons on with me. Clint, thanks so much for being on the show. Dustin, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. So, Clint, talk to us about what you do to provide for your family without working that dead-end J-O-B. Well, you know, I, I built a business, and so I built a law firm, uh, started in 99 with my partner, and we started building this up, and now we have over 500 employees and offices in multiple states. And, uh, and along the way, you know, I was building an asset. I realized that that when I became an attorney, I wanted to build a business. So many people in my profession, you know, they, they have a practice and they don't see it as a business or something that they could build value around. And so they're stuck. For example, a good friend of mine in, in this area where I, where I reside in Gig Harbor, Washington, when we go on vacations together, uh, when our kids were young, we'd always try to plan something. He'd say, oh, I can't be away for more than about seven or nine days. And, and what I built with, with the firm is I could stay for three weeks in Hawaii and it didn't matter. And so my business was there and it was doing, it's been doing well, extremely well. But I realized during that time is that I wanted to ensure that I'm creating generational wealth. I created a business that, that has assets could be sold, uh, but I want to create generational wealth. And that was going to be through real estate because my father, I grew up in a real estate background. He was an avid real estate investor. And the only reason he wanted kids, two sons, I know you have what, four? Four kids, yep. Indentured servants. I mean, <laughs> you send them out there. If they bitch about not getting paid, you say, where are you sleeping at night? And how, who's going to feed you? So um, I grew up with that. In fact, I wanted to be a contractor. So I was a framer while I was going to college, but I live in Washington state. And I'll tell you what, you only got about three good months of, uh, of framing weather and the rest sucks. So uh, I, I backed off of that. So fast forward, when I started building the real estate, and you talk a lot about this, treating it as a business. You know, my real estate, I've tra treated it like a business. I create the right structures around it to ensure that I'm protecting it from the threats, making sure that I'm maximizing my tax benefits that come from my real estate. But that business side, this is something that most investors do not understand. And that's what's made Anderson so successful in what we do is that we teach our clients that yeah, you can set up structures around your investing and you can do it a certain way, but there are ways that will help you do more if you just change the way your income hits your tax return or the types of structures you're creating for your investments. And that, unfortunately for me, came through trial and error. I mean, I, when I started Anderson Hill, I thought taxes were the best thing to do if you could reduce them down to zero. So that's what we did for four years, paid zero in federal income tax on say $600,000 in income, annual income. Thought I was so smart. Try to parlay that into buying a building when you when the underwriter asks for copies of your tax returns and they show zero taxable income. So that's what I'm talking about, the business side of investing. And that's, I think, is so important. A lot of people don't get that because they're local professionals. They may be really good at reducing taxes. They may be great at uh, putting together a business for them. But if they don't understand what you're doing, then it's not going to benefit you. I think it's also fun that you were a framer. My dad was a contractor, so I framed. I did a lot of framing, and it was in California, in Fresno. It gets to be like 110 degrees in the summer, and that's when I would do the framing. It was horribly hot, and it was it was a rough job. It's definitely a thankless job doing doing framing. So when you are looking at a business and making sure that it can basically run itself. And it, let's say there's somebody that has an idea for a business. Now they already have the idea, they're already starting to make a little bit of money, but now they're really realizing, I wanna start branching out to where I don't literally, I'm not changing or trading an hour for a dollar. Like I'm not the one doing all the work. Do you, what, what would you say, like what are your advice to now take that next step instead of trading the time to where you're now hiring employees. Because with 500 employees, you have to have something, right, that is actually making sure that the systems are running and everything like that. Yeah, so the problem I think a lot of people have is that they don't understand that in order to make money, you have to invest. People think, tend to see things as a cost. Oh, if I bring that person on, that's going to cost me. And whenever I hear that come out of someone's mouth, that tells me they have a preservation mindset. I sit on a few boards now because I have gray hairs uh, of younger companies. And 
I, I hear it every single time when they get together that, you know, they're talking about, you know, expansion, but they always go back to that word cost. And, and it's important to, to, to look at that. But I, the way I often tell someone is that if it's going to help you do more, it's going to help you grow, then that is an investment. And, and you need to focus on that aspect uh, of the business. And so what I've done in, in my businesses, I've set them up so I've replaced myself that all of that is done by other people and it becomes their responsibility. It took it, it took a little bit of sacrifice to make that investment initially, but the returns have really paid off. So in the, the law firm that I have, that where we do both, you know, I have CPAs working for me and, and tax attorneys. And then on the real estate side, I have my own property management company, my my own rehab teams that go out and do the properties. I have my own um, a bird dogs group that goes out there and, and finds it all. I used to try to do that stuff myself. And I realized you have what is called high value and low value work. And so many people get focused on the low value as well when they're, they're, they're starting to build their business or their, whatever it is they're doing. Like you're talking about framing. There's, comes, there's some satisfaction from when you do that. Right now I'm, I'm working on a house. I just bought an investment property that my son now is going to buy from me or half of it from me. And uh, the house needs rehab work. And so we went in the last couple of weekends, we've torn out the kitchen and we've got it down to the studs now. And, and, and I'm teaching him the skills that I learned from my father, because I never invested in where I live because the market to me, it was, a, it was a sweat, it's a sweat equity market. But that, I mean, let's be frank, my time is better spent doing other things and spending a full or two days a, a week on that property. But I'm fortunate enough at a point in time in my life that it doesn't matter. I mean, the money just keeps coming in because I've built passive streams. So I can take that time to do that. Where, where investors screw up is that a lot of times they get so focused on doing that low value stuff, they're missing the opportunities that are out there. My dad is case in point. He did all his own rehab, buy a house, rehab it, fix it up. We would actually buy houses for a dollar, pick them up, move them, drop them on center block foundation, spend all the time putting it all back together. What he should have been doing is hiring that out, but that was a cost and gone out and buy 10 properties for a dollar each. And so he missed the opportunity there because people started to realize, hey, wait, this house is worth more than that. So that's the mistake I see a lot of people make. When you're spending money, people think, can think that it's a cost as, or it's it's not gonna give you any return. That's the thing. I don't hire anybody unless they're gonna do either one of two things, make my life easier or make me money. And those are the two reasons why I hire them. And then when I do, I'm expecting that return because it's an investment. You're 100% right. So talk to us a little about, because you you have a fantastic YouTube channel showing all this stuff about asset protection. Talk to us a little bit about our businesses as we're creating it. Is there any insights as we're building a business? It could be real estate investing, could be you know a brick and mortar or an online company. Is there any insights that you can wean for, or you know that you've weaned off of everything that you've done that you can share with us so that we're going to be protecting ourselves well with any one of our businesses? Yeah, so it comes down to understanding why we invest. Okay, so if you're investing in single family, like I know you are, I mean, or residential, as you like to refer to it, and, you know, four units or less, the motivation is to build generational wealth. But as you've stated, you're not in it for appreciation. If you go in it for appreciation, you're, you know, if you don't have time the market right, you're going to get burned. And so we invest for cash flow. And where I see a lot of investors make mistakes is that they don't appreciate that their investment, the value of their investment is not in the equity in the property or the, how much is that property worth. The value is in the income because that income is what gives you the flexibility to live the life you want to live. So you work three hours a month by that income that replaced your, your J-O-B. So when investors are considering, well, you know, do I set up an LLC? Do I set up a trust? Or what, what, where do, how do I put this at? Where do I put this asset? I often tell them, you know, you want to make sure that you're preserving that income. And, and so the mistakes that I've seen people make, and I used to tell people this as well when I, when I, you know, earlier in my career, I'd say, oh, I'll take four or five properties, put them in one LLC. And I didn't appreciate the fact that by doing that, if something went wrong with one of those investments, They've jeopardized all five properties, but I would look at it from equity. Most of these investors had about $60,000 or $100,000 in equity in the property. I say, oh, you, you know, it's $300,000 you put at risk. I didn't look at it from the income side where I'm saying, wait a minute, you just put $40,000 in annual income at risk. And that was the income allowed your wife to quit. And where I had that epiphany was when I was sitting with this couple 
And their son, uh, two years before, had clipped somebody. He had gone up to ASU and clipped somebody in in an intersection and made them a paraplegic. And this family, I think they were in Oklahoma, if I recall, they're telling me the story about how they had built up all this real estate and they had 25 homes or something like that, and they'd retired. And then that tragedy struck and it bankrupted them. And so now here they are sitting down with me two years after the fact, they're in their 60s and they're back at a W-2 jobs, J-O-Bs, and they're trying to restart their investing. And so when you're thinking about it, the likelihood of being sued or anything going wrong, pretty small. I mean, I have close to 400 properties and I've never been sued once, but I've seen things happen. The two properties burned down this year and nobody got hurt. But if they did, you know, that could be a lawsuit in, you know, they say, Hey, you didn't have working smoke detectors. Yeah. But the tenant disabled, it doesn't seem to matter. And so you have to understand there, there's also that when do you shift? And so I'm not saying if you had a hundred properties, you need a hundred LLCs because that's just stupid. But you get to the point now where I can lose a 10 pack and my lifestyle is never going to change because I lost 10 properties and $60,000 on an annual basis. I'm no longer receiving. And so there's that graduation where you move into a different style of investing. So would you suggest, is it dollar amount per LLC that you, in in income, I I completely, I think it's a great way to think of it. Is it a dollar amount or because more than likely it's not total amount of properties like Two properties that are worth a million dollars each is totally different than 10 properties that are worth, you know, $20,000 each. So what would you suggest, like, as far as creating an LLC and putting different properties in LLC? Is it more like risk tolerance and how much you're willing to risk at a given time? I think for a lot of people it is. But I'll give you an example of what I did for for, for my daughter. She's a a real estate investor now. She has three properties. And um, she asked me about that. She said, Dad, how many LLCs should I have? And I said, well... If something happens on any one of those properties, understand that if all three are in one, all three are at risk. So you know what you're bringing in. Do you want to risk all three of those properties in case something went wrong? Her answer was, no, I like that, you know, $400 a month that each of them brings in. I said, well, then the answer, you've already solved the question. The dilemma for yourself is just put one property per limited liability company. You know, you're going to say, well, that, that's a cost. No, it's an investment. The investment is, is that if anything were to happen, And I've had a few clients that have been sued for millions and millions of dollars. And they walked away just by paying their policy premiums. Those went to the the plaintiffs and nothing more. And not one of them ever came back and said to me, and so because of their net worth, don't get shocked at this number. Hey, Clint, um, I really regret the fact that I paid you $35,000 to protect you know, $25 million in assets. That just, that, that was such a bad decision <laughs> I made back then. Uh, and it was just, you know, it's always been quite the opposite of uh, their reaction is. So when you're thinking about planning, you want to make sure that you're protecting those, those assets from those mistakes that do happen, unfortunately. So how do you mitigate any, uh, I mean, is it basically calling up somebody like like you and working with your company to make sure that we analyze everything that we're doing? Or is it something that we would say, you know, our risk tolerance and we put X, Y, and Z? I mean, it seems like it's, you. Ha- if nobody, if somebody listening to this has never done any asset protection, hasn't really even looked into it, it's going to, you can easily come into many, many problems. Is it the best thing to do is to call up somebody like, you know, a company like yours and really just run through the entire scenario of everything? Well, first off, educate yourself. All right. So you know how to ask meaningful questions and you know whether or not the person that you're talking to understands what it is you're doing. I mean, if you walk into an attorney's office and you say, hey, I want to start a house hacking strategy business. And he tells you that's an illegal activity. You know, you're not talking to the right person because they don't understand what you're doing. When you ask, you know, do you do it on your own or you go you hire someone? It goes back to that high value, low value. Is your t- do you want to try to figure out what is the right type of structure for that particular state where you're investing? Because although we tend to embrace it's a one size fits all because everyone typically talks in, in the, uses the term limited liability company for your investing, there are nuances to states that you need to be aware of. And an LLC might be right for Washington state, but I'm in Florida, it's going to be a land trust or Texas, it's going to be a series LLC. And if you jump to Tennessee, it's going to be a different type of series LLC, or maybe it's a land trust with a series. So those are all the things that 
get baked into it. And, you know, it's where people end up sometimes making mistakes, unintended consequences of their structures, because the structure itself, even though it gets set up and it's providing asset protection, you find out now it's more difficult to possibly borrow or your tax returns don't look the way they should. So you really have to factor all that into it. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Now, you mentioned series LLC. I get a lot of students who I coach, they say, hey, I've heard about series LLC. And I'm like, well, I don't know much about it. And it, I've heard also that the series LLC, there's not a lot of cases against it or to prove it or disprove it, like being good or bad. What are your thoughts on the series LLC? You know, if you use it, it'll hold up. I mean, there was a recent case out of Nevada, series LLC, same thing. Somebody tried to make the argument, well, you know, we had all these different cells set up and, and therefore we should just ignore it because it was all part of the same business. You know, we had uh, delivery trucks in one, uh, I forget some logistics in a different cell. And the court said, no, unless you can prove that, you know, there was some commingling or something like that, they're going to be treated as separate units. And the other thing I tell people is, is that in a case like that, that's not the first time a series LLC has come under attack. The only reason why we know about it is because at the trial court level, the trial court said, nah, we're just gonna ignore the cells. And so of course the defendant's going to appeal that decision and say, trial court, you screwed up. These cells are separate entities for asset protection purposes. And so then it gets appealed. Then there's the decision like the one I'm referring to where the appellate court upholds it. So they've been tested. So to think they haven't, because there's not a lot of pins out there, it just means that they've with, withstood the assault, because if not, someone would appeal. So if you can use it, I would use it because it simplifies things. I'm all about, it. I don't like to complicate structure. Sometimes they'll say, well, it looks complicated, Clint. Yeah, it can be a lot worse. I've seen some things come across where people have 15 different boxes protecting four properties. And I've said, that's a monster. That's going to impair your ability to grow because layer upon layer upon layer, when you get asked to see document or an underwriter wants to see documents and they, and they can't ever track it back to you, they're going to think you're some drug lord from South America. So you got to be careful on how many layers you go with your planning. So I was talking with uh, an investor as well. He was a lawyer, um, a big corporate lawyer. Now he doesn't have to do it because he has plenty of investments. Now he just does it when he wants to. And he, I was asking him a question, like, should I have a company that's like basically like the parent company that owns other companies underneath it? And is that enough protection? Meaning like one company owning eight companies underneath it. And he said, well, what I've done in the past is I would literally get through that LLC, the first one. And then even if you have like eight layers, I'll get to the very top. He says he's done it before. I was like, oh, wow, that's interesting. And so he said, suggested wise to me, it says literally have them separate. What are your thoughts on that? Because like I said, he literally told me he's done it before, gone all the way to the top. Now, obviously different circumstances and all that sort of stuff. Is that wise or what are your, what are your thoughts? What I try to do for, for real estate investors is, is to explain to them, well, what we do is we explain to them, hey, there's this asset protection side, there's the tax planning, and then there's that business planning side. So you want to create a structure that's going to isolate out all your assets from each other and, and make sure that if something goes wrong with one of them fails, the rest won't. On the tax side, we want to ensure that we're setting it up in a way in which we can, if you want to qualify for a real estate professional status or if you're in short-term rentals, that you can uh, uh, hit that material participation. Th those types of things that allow you then to cost seg if, if you're the viewers aren't familiar with that term, which means through that you accelerate your depreciation. And with the bonus depreciation right now, you can get some huge tax breaks. But on the tax side, you want to make sure that your business, those deductions that you're taking are going to get added back into your income. So it doesn't appear like I told you earlier, I made $600,000, but I wiped out all my income. The ways I was wiping out my income, when I went to a borrower, they didn't say, oh, well, really, we see you had 600,000. So we'll just make it that you make $600,000 a year so you can qualify for this purchase. They said, no, you make zero, you don't qualify. So, so that's key. I will typically structure it with a holding company, one LLC that owns everything on the passive side from the real estate that flows into it. And I set that up as a partnership, which gives you a K-1. And the reason I do this is because most brokers that you deal with, they're going to underwrite with Freddie Fannie guidelines. And Freddie Fannie guidelines restrict how much of your rental income they can use for qualification purposes for that next loan. So, so if more of your income is on the rental income side, 
And those properties are hitting your 1040 Schedule E page one, which is where they would hit if you're using disregarded LLCs or you own the property in your own name or through a trust. The underwriter will take off 25 to 30% of that income and treat it as if you didn't even receive it. So when I'm borrowing, going in for that next loan, my debt to income ratio numbers are getting very compressed and I may not qualify. So what I'll do instead is I'll stick them in a, a holding company that's one box down below that owns all these other LLCs and it all flows through there and that one's gonna file a tax return. And I get people pushing back on that. and say, well, I was told I don't have to file a tax return and that's just another expense. Okay, it's an investment because it's gonna help you do more because that income now hits your 1040 in a different spot. Still rental income, everything's the same, but because of where it hits your tax return, Freddie Franny looks at it from a different perspective and they give you 100% of the income. So it bumps up your ability to continue to invest. And so, you know, wouldn't you like to be in a situation where you're knowing that by completing this return, I'm going to be able to grow faster than the guy next to me? Because you're going to look at him, you're going to go, God, he's only got five properties. I've got 10. What's the difference? Typically, it's how they approach it as a business. And that's why I, I use that planning. If you created seven LLCs, all treated as partnerships to do that for yourself, that's seven tax returns. That doesn't make sense to me because then you start running up against the cost benefit analysis. It can get too complicated. That's, I love that. Those are great ideas. Now, when we are looking to build our business even more, let's say we have a business and we want to diversify like you with real estate investing to you know other businesses and getting in syndication and all that sort of stuff. Do you have any tips or any advice for anyone who is now starting to say, you know, I'm actually starting to branch out now to create more businesses? Because you've done that. You now have 500 employees. You also have real estate. You have all these other things going on. So do you have any tips that we can see or utilize in our lives as we are going to be scaling our business and branching out to multiple businesses? Yeah. So first off, I'd look at whether or not you're, you're married and who's going to go on the loans. And if you're starting a, a new business, a lot of times people are going to tell you, set it up through an S corp or through a pass through. The problem with those situations is that when an underwriter looks at your, your application, you have to disclose it if you own 20% or more, they're going to know that you're in business for yourself and they're going to scrutinize your business. And so it's not, it's not only about you any longer. Now it's about turning over your balance sheet, your P&L and your tax returns for your business. And so that's why I don't like pass through businesses. I prefer that when you're starting up a business, you set it up as a C corp. And I would give the non-owner or the spouse that's not participating in the business, I'd give them the majority ownership. I would hold a very small ownership piece of that, pay myself out a huge salary to if I still needed to borrow. So, so if you need to borrow, this is what I would do. Increase my W-2 so then I look better to lenders when I go into borrow because I don't look like that small business owner. Now, on the flip side of that, in looking at the business, make, maybe you're doing really well right now. So I'm a C corporation at Anderson because... I don't want all that money passing through to me. I leave that income in the business because many times it's going to be used for growth. And so if it comes out to me, it's going to get taxed at 37%, then I got to put it back in. Or in the past, I didn't take the money out. So I was paying taxes on money I never received. And I look at my account, like I said, you made $600,000 and you look at your account and you say for the year, you only put $100,000 into it after taxes. That's because everything else stayed in the business. With a C-Corp, it's taxed at a flat 21%. And so for a lot of people, if you're not below that, it makes sense to have that entity in place because it's going to give you more to invest with. And my clients that flip that make, you know, a million to a million and a half a year, that's one of the things that we do. I leave their majority of that income in the C corporation because they're buying more properties. And their CPAs will look at that strategy when I propose it and say, oh, that's just stupid. You're going to have double taxation. I'm like, no. Yes, you do when they pull it out eventually. But if you look at their marginal, total marginalized tax on that, it's about an inch percentage to one and a half percent higher than where they are now. So even when it gets taxed twice, so rather than paying 37, you're paying 38. But what they don't look at is I just saved them 16%. So on 16% on a million, that's $160,000. So they have more income that they can invest with. And that over 10 years, that's going to amount to quite a few dollars in their bank accounts. There's so many different things that if you don't know it, if you're not in it, then you definitely need to hire people. I, I love hiring my property managers. 
my accountants and the lawyers. Like, I don't want to be the expert, just like my property managers in the areas that I invest. I don't want to be the expert in wherever they're investing. I don't want to be the expert in counting. I, I'm horrible at accounting. Same thing with law. I don't want to be the expert. We need to hire the right people. Now, Clint, I know people are going to want to reach out to you. They're going to want to even check out your YouTube channel, which has a wealth of information on there. So how can people find you and reach out to you? Well, they go to my YouTube channel. You just type in Clint Coons on YouTube Asset Protection. It'll bring you to my channel, Real Estate Asset Protection. Um, but if you want to learn more, we, I actually teach an event every couple of weeks on asset protection. It's on Saturday and it's myself and my partner, Toby Mathis. And, and so what we do in that event is that we go through just what we, you and I have been talking about, setting up the right structures for various types of investing strategies. So we do that in the morning. And then in the afternoon, my partner takes over and he talks about that tax and business planning side. And he shows you how you can take real estate and use it to eliminate all the income that you're bringing in from your properties and put yourself in a position where you have tax-free income from your real estate activities, but you're not impairing your ability to borrow. So it's really designed for real estate investors to understand the business side of building a real estate business. And if they wanted to, um, to attend, uh, I got a link here. If you want to put it in the show notes, if they just go to aba.link forward slash sus22, um, they can register. There's no cost for it. And then they can join myself and, and my partner, Toby, as we teach them a lot more about this area of investing. Definitely. I'll put that link inside the show notes and we'll make sure that everybody gets that out. Uh, to, and I mean, you give out so much great free information and showing people literally so many different ideas of how to protect yourself, how to do everything right. So I fully appreciate how much you give out there and just having the idea of serving other people is just, I, I love being around other people who have that same vision to serve other people. So Clint, hey, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate you. Dustin, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Take care.